Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We got a lot on the agenda today, breaking down news of the day. My dear friend, extraordinary host, commentator, journalist, Sharon Reed. Also breaking down news of the day, it's going to be a surprise, okay? But when I tell you this is going to be a treat, not like the wacko we had yesterday. This is going to be an actual treat, okay? I thought I needed to make it up to you, Shelly Winter and a few others, okay? All right, top story of the day. Let's put up his picture. Cop has been arrested for child molestation. This is in Carrollton, Georgia, all right? Let me give you some background to this situation. Carrollton School Resource Officer was arrested and fired after being charged with child molestation on Friday. Jarek Gilbert, that's his name, 35 years of age, was booked into the Carroll County Jail on one count each of child molestation and violation of oath by a public officer. Now we're still getting details as this story develops. Here's some more background, an internal investigation by the Carroll to Police Department led to Gilbert's immediate termination. In a statement released Friday, the department wrote in part, Carrollton Police Department and Carrollton City Schools acted immediately to ensure the safety of students and the school system has taken the appropriate actions to ensure full cooperation with local and state authorities. Gilbert was sworn in as an officer July 2015. He was promoted to the rank of corporal in November 2021. Okay, how many stories have we highlighted right here on Indisputable where police officers, police officers are engaged in this kind of monstrous activity? We have had story after story where police officers were engaged in inappropriate sexual contact to child molestation, trying to solicit sex in exchange for a positive testimony or to drop a citation. And then we have situations like this, the most egregious of them all, monsters against children. As I've said before, I will say again, there are real monsters inside of our school system. Critical race theory is not one of them because it's not even taught. And if it was taught, it wouldn't be a monster. This guy's a monster. But do you think Republicans will create legislation to enhance policy to make sure monsters like this do not exist in our school system? No, no, it doesn't fit their narrative. Not enough meat on the bone for their political classification currently. Let me give you some background. I decided to do some research about police officers and sexual assaults. Here's the information. A study by the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank that tracks police wrongdoing, found that sexual misconduct by law enforcement generates more citizen complaints than any other factor except excessive force. There's more. There's another investigation by the Associated Press found that roughly 1,000 officers lost their badges, lost their badges in a six year period for rape, sodomy and other sexual assault. Sex crimes that included possession of child pornography or sexual misconduct, such as propositioning citizens to have consensual sex, but it's prohibited based on on duty intercourse. Now, here I do have a problem with the data set. And let me provide some context. In the Associated Press, their data set included individuals, cops, who engaged in soliciting for sex in exchange for favors within law enforcement or within the criminal justice system. Uh, that's rape too, that's sexual assault too, in my opinion. But that's the way they decided to contextualize the data. Now, out of those 1,000 cops who lost their badge, How many of them were prosecuted for actual crimes? Less than 1%, less than 1%, there's more. A database compiled by the Buffalo News reports that from 2005 to 2015, 
a law enforcement official was caught in a case of sexual abuse or misconduct at least once every five days. Wow. There's a connection. Remember when we talked about these isms that exist, they coexist. You have racism, you have sexism, you have all of these isms that coexist within a particular industry and the industry tends to be policing. We talk about reform, but we have to now talk about replacement. It is so rotten to the core that the industry is attracting individuals who will prefer to engage in this kind of perverted activity. It's not just force, it's also sexual force. It goes beyond the pale. All right, Sharon, thoughts on this? You know, first of all, the statement from the school was shot. Yeah. They said they did all they could. And then they said, we can't comment further. That was the end of the statement. We can't comment because it's an ongoing investigation. He's already been fired. He was fired in 10 minutes. Okay, so there's that. One of the parents I was reading an article with Sean was quoted as saying, he was a great guy. He became my child's best friend, danced with my child. I bet he did. Okay, so when they talk about an officer, they should want to comment all throughout this investigation. I want to know how many other kids there are. How many other victims there are, and you're right, words matter. Seven years on the force, one promotion, how many other kids did he dance with? That's what I wanna know. It infuriates me, you know, I'm a parent. We worry about this kind of stuff, I'm a single parent. Those kids are targeted more than others. Um, I, I just think it's, it's disgusting, I'm not blaming Carrollton police, but tell us everything and keep on talking. Yeah. You know, and it's so fascinating you say that it's something similar that I say uh, on this show as well. You routinely see a massaging of the facts, yeah. even in the most egregious cases like this, if there's a law enforcement official involved. You know what we don't have? We can't get his mug shot, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so, mm -hmm. so let's be clear. If this were a regular citizen, that would be the first thing the police promoted on their press release about what happened. There's no press conference. They didn't hold a press conference about this cop who violated not only the public trust, but the innocence of at least one child. And you're right, the statement from the school does not ex express a sentiment that says, now we need to investigate to make sure there are no other victims. And here's the protocol, here's the phone number to reach out. Here's the way to connect with us so we can make sure that this did not happen to other children. And where's the enhancement to the safety protocols? None of that was mentioned. All right. He's done it again. Uh, he's just begging for his privilege to get him in trouble. Congressman Madison Cawthorn brought a gun to the airport, should have went to jail. I would have went to jail, but he gets to avoid going to jail because he's a United States Congressman. Put up his picture full mass here. Okay, white privilege. Now let's get into the background. He was caught at the Charlotte Douglas Airport. And this is not the first time, all right? This was a photo taken by another passenger obtained by Channel 9. Reporter John Paul shows Cawthorn at one of the checkpoints, okay? Details as reported by Channel 9, according to the Transportation Security Administration, TSA. He had a nine millimeter handgun was discovered in a bag at checkpoint D. TSA officials contacted the local police. A photo obtained by channel nine shows that a loaded nine millimeter was recovered at the airport on Tuesday. Let's put up a picture of the gun. Now remember, completely against federal law here, completely against the law. Anybody else would go to jail, be arrested immediately, okay? He was not. Officers did confirm the gun was in fact Congressman Cawthorn's and said he cooperated with the police. Well, you bring a gun to a plane and as long as you cooperate with the police, you get to go home. And once again, the police are trying to massage the language here. They want you to think, oh, you know what? He was actually a nice guy about bringing a firearm on the plane. He was, so we had to let him go. There's more. Uh, Cawthorn was cited for possession of a dangerous weapon on city property, uh, which is a city of Charlotte ordinance. 
Uh, the CMPD said it took the firearm, which is normal procedure. Uh, now, remember, this is not the first time a gun has been discovered on Cawthorn, okay? At an airport, nonetheless. Let's go back to 2021. TSA found a nine millimeter handgun in Cawthorn's carry on bag at Asheville Regional Airport. Cawthorn did not face any criminal charges for the incident then. Oh, and let me go out on a limb and say this. He probably brings a gun every time he travels because him scared, okay? All right, now there's a way, there's a proper way to transport your weapon. There's a proper way to do it. What he's doing is completely illegal, but he knows something. He knows he would never go to jail for it. He knows nobody will actually arrest him for it. And here's why. Channel 9 tried to determine why was he never arrested. The Constitution talks about situations just like this, specifically Article 1, Section 6, Clause 1, regarding members of Congress. It says they shall in all cases except treason, felony and breach of the peace be privileged. There's that word from arrest during their attendance at the session. As a political expert, his name is Dr. Michael Bitzer said, and I quote, I think certainly if he presented himself as a member of Congress and indicated that he was on his way to legislative business, particularly, uh, particularly votes on the House floor, I think individuals at Charlotte Douglas probably would have erred on the side of caution and disregard, and they did. But here's the other thing, discretion is at play here. CMPD has discretion in these cases and says most times they don't arrest a person unless there are other related felony charges or extenuating circumstances. Um, this is uh, quite interesting, multiple times being cited for bringing a firearm on an airplane, multiple times being uh, pulled over for driving when he is not supposed to without a license. No penalty, okay? No penalty whatsoever, all right? Now, he's out of control. Madison Cawthorn is out of control. But all of Congress, especially those on the conservative side, are out of control. All right, Sharon, thoughts on this? You know, I wonder how many mistakes one has afforded. How many times is it a mistake? How many times does he forget that he has the gun? I wonder if it was reclaiming my time, mm. Maxine Waters. What yeah. if it was her? You think discretion would have been shown there? The next phrase she would have uttered is, don't tase me, bro. Okay, mm -hmm. this whole thing is so ridiculous. I, I've i studied the Constitution, but not as much as you, Dr. Ritchie. Um, but to know that the word privilege is actually written in is fitting, <laughs> very fitting, it's very fitting. Um, Cause here we go again, when there's so many crazies in Congress right now, somebody needs to go on and revise this, okay? He's gotta be made an example of, we both know that's not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, well said. All right, we'll continue to follow. We'll give you his next citation that should have led to an <laughs> arrest. All right, we'll follow that story when it comes. You know, they tell us that there are more good cops than bad cops. Well, that's what they say. And I actually used to believe that until I thought about it. I said, you know, if there are just way more good cops than bad cops, that means the culture of policing would be good. And the bad cops would be on an island. The bad cops would be external of the cop family. They would be the outcast, not the other way around. Once again, another story about good cops doing the right thing, seeing discrimination against a citizen, filing a complaint against a cop. And what does the police agency do? Well, they retaliate against the good cops who decided to advocate for citizens against the bad cop. Let me bring your attention to New Jersey. Two New Jersey officers, let's put up this picture. Two New Jersey officers are suing their department for alleged retaliation following a complaint against a fellow officer for an incident of blatant racial profiling. Sergeant Preston Freeman on the right in 2019 is being promoted to his current rank. And then you have Lieutenant Nicole Stavele, 2020 following a promotion to Lieutenant, all right? Both officers made history in diversity, equity and inclusion in the department. We're talking about some trailblazing people. 
The 19 page complaint submitted on their behalf by attorney Robert Ballard occurred several weeks after the two were suspended without pay for 45 days. Can I say that again? Suspended without pay for 45 days. You can put a bullet in the back of an unarmed black man and not get suspended without pay for 45 days. But if you, as a police officer, if you stand up for a citizen, if you cite their discrimination against a citizen, this is what happens to you. This is the culture that comes against you. There's more, the force has started complaining the two engaged in unlawful behavior while on duty, which a lawsuit alleges the allegations were part of the retaliation against them for describing the discrimination against citizens. Let me give you some details to the lawsuit. On Friday, March 25th, Freeman, the first black sergeant in the Westfield Police Department and the only African American on the force for his first 15 years. Anne Stavele, uh, the highest ranking female officer in the force's history, okay? Filed a lawsuit in Superior Court in Union City alleging retaliation and discrimination. Their superiors hit them with 10 charges. Look at how they fought back now. They don't go to court, they don't try to defend their actions. They decide to hit them with 10 charges, claiming they violated departmental and internal affairs procedures and departmental rules and regulations when they wrote up a fellow officer for treating traffic offenders differently based on the color of their skin. Now remember, the police department, they don't give a damn about the discrimination that's happening. They care that you told on them. That's the issue they have, okay? There's more. When recalling the January 29th, 2020 ordeal that sparked the charges, the lawsuit said a white male officer named Christopher Forcinito was assigned to work the night shift alongside the other two officers. While patrolling, the two officers said they observed their white colleague stop a black male on East Broad Street for speeding and failure to keep right. As a result, the cop issued the transgressing motorist a summons for driving with an expired license. Later during the ship, the same officer stopped a white male who was driving 65 miles per hour on the East Broad Street where the speed limit is 25. That's called a super speeder in my state. However, he did not. He did not give him a summons, only giving him a verbal warning before letting him go. Let's put up a picture of cop friendly to white people only. His name is Christopher Forcinito, as I said, hired in 2015, been there for a few years. However, based on rank, that guy is a subordinate to the other two. They outrank him. So as the ranking officers involved, they decided to do something. They filed a complaint on behalf of the citizens. The lawsuit states when Freeman questioned Forcinito about the discrepancy, Forcinito responded, he didn't have to issue a ticket and that the driver was a nice guy. When Freeman and Stavale asked him to write up a report sharing why he chose to give one ticket to one and not the other. Guess what, the subordinate cop, Forcinito, he refused, okay? He had the, um, I know you outrank me, but you can kiss my ass mentality. Isn't that something? I thought police officers believe in hierarchy. We just did a story yesterday about two cops that pulled over another cop who was a black male detective in their own city and still asked him, well, sir, where are you going? He said, I'm a detective, I'm in full uniform. It's a police car, you pulled me over. They didn't give a damn that this detective outranked them. Just like these cops or this cop did not care that these cops, both of them outranked him. Starting to see a trend here. The lawsuit states no investigation was conducted into the actions. None, no investigation, even though superiors said this happened. 
The two would become targets as a result of this. Let me give you some background to how. Within days of their reporting for Sunito, instead of seeing a follow up on the discrimination allegations play out, Stavele was told by the top brass that she, that she was the target of an internal investigation because she acted inappropriately when she suspended the officer for racial profiling. That officer was also slated to become the department's accreditation manager, but the job was given to a white male officer instead. Additionally, the lawsuit afforded Freeman the space to speak about over a decade's worth of discrimination he has endured as a minority on the force. In detail, the claim shows a history of acts that have singled out Sergeant Freeman in ways that seem to be based on his race. Remember, Sergeant Freeman was there for years as the only black police officer. Now, I get what you all are trying to do, and to some degree is noble. It took you a while to get here, but you finally put them on paper. You finally did it. You put them on paper, and what did they do? They came against you. You see, I'm not against police, I'm against bad police. I'm standing up for these two police officers who are doing the right thing. Now, I can make an argument they should have started that way some years back. But that's a different conversation for a different segment. Right now, what needs to hit every single person watching this is the culture of policing. The culture is adversarial to cops who are good, okay? Let's put up a picture of the chief. He's the guy in charge, right? The buck stops with him. He permeates the culture. That culture exists because of his protection of it. One past incident involved the police chief. His name is Christopher Badaloro. He tried to throw out Freeman's promotional exam results, the black guy, the black cop. He tried to throw out his exam results when the chief found out Freeman scored the second highest on the sergeant's exam. To become a sergeant, you gotta take a sergeant's test. He wanted to throw out the exam results. Freeman had hired an attorney at the time and threatened to sue if the results were discounted. That threat prompted the chief to promote Freeman to sergeant, okay? You still talking about reform? I'm talking about replacement. Sharon, thoughts here. Well, he's gotta go. You know, I'm probably a thousand miles from, what is it, Westfield? Yeah. The Westfield Police Department in New Jersey, I'm a thousand miles away. I can smell the stench right here. I'm in Atlanta, I can smell the stench from here, rotten to the core. This whole thing that we've been told for decades about, you know, most police are good. Cops are good, it's just a few rotten apples, you're right. Rule of law, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, he had to sue after passing the test and doing better than one of his counterparts. Here we are, it tells you everything you need to know about the Westfield Police Department and what was done here. It's disgusting, and I'm gonna tell you this, in about 10 minutes, the chief looks like he's probably nearing retirement. About 10 minutes, Rashad, officer friendly only to white people, he'll be the new chief. Watch. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I want to say this because um, when we post this on YouTube and, and Facebook Watch, there'll be people that are pro police mm -hmm. that push back. Listen, I'm pro public safety. And if police officers are good, they are pro public safety as well. But let's be very clear. And I'm saying this to any cop who sees this. I know you may think you're good because you don't do some of the things that people like Forcenito will do. But you're not as good as you think you are if you're silent when it happens in front of you. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. What's happening? Welcome back. Okay, we got a lot of show left. I'm gonna read some of these amazing comments. Before I get to the comments, let me remind everyone. Few things happening, okay? May 3rd, May 3rd. It's progressives versus the establishment, all right? We'll be providing live coverage Tuesday, May 3rd for the Ohio and Indiana primary elections. We'll be playing, uh, paying attention to races connected to Senator Nina Turner for Ohio's 11th district. 
Morgan Harper, uh, and both of them obviously friends of the program uh, for US Senate uh, and others, all right? So here's what we need you to do. Tune in, tune in 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific time uh, to make that happen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You're gonna feel great. Back off! I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. What? 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 Karenicity runs deep here. Uh, this is what happens when two Karens, a male Karen and female Karen, decide to get together. Um, a savage. You commit criminal acts, destruction of property, terroristic threats over a damn savage. Okay. You don't deserve whatever sandwich you're asking for. Now, according to the report here, uh, the young lady was asking for what's called a sloppy sandwich. There's more. There's been plenty of people that have walked into New York subway and I've asked them, can you make my sandwich? This is not how it's supposed to be made. What are you supposed to do? Shut the up and do your Over subway sandwich. Now, the male Karen said he could walk into a New York subway. Well, they were actually in Vermont, according to the post here. Um, here's the thing. Once again, we provide a reflection. We provide mirror for reflection and correction. The reality is, you don't talk to service people like this. Individuals that keep America moving. This will not stand, and that's why we are happy to highlight individuals like this. Karen, well, both of them on this program. I remember, I remember what it was like, waiting tables, uh, being a cook, washing dishes. I remember those jobs. Uh, those jobs are tough. Really, some of the hardest work I've ever done, consistent work. And then the psychological aspect of rude people like that, not tolerable, all right? Sharon, what are your thoughts here? I, I'm, you know. I'm still stuck on the campaign, refreshing, refresh. I mean, that subway and that situation look a lot different, Rashad, than <laughs> Steph Curry and Simone Biles, the one they were in. It's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Okay, you had the brother and sister working behind the counter. Even more ridiculous, though, was did you notice how long this drama played out? At one point, the manager actually comes out after it's an assault. You tell me, Dr. Richie, I think it's an assault. You're throwing things, you're destroying property. Yes. It's an he assault. comes out and he. He reasons with Karen and the male Karen. He tries to actually have a conversation with them. Privilege, there we go again. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? Uh, every time I see a manager who decides to acquiesce to the violence of a customer against one of their employees, I already know that manager is probably horrible at managing. Because you don't have enough respect for those that look to you for leadership to make a decisive ethical decision and say, no, my employee will not be treated that way and you have to get out of here. I don't care what the argument started over. It doesn't matter once you've engaged in physical combat, destruction of property, physical assault. Get the hell up out of my store. Mm. All right, I got something for everybody. Double dose. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're gonna feel great, back off! I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Sorry, no, you're not. Thank you. You're right, I'm not. LOL. LOL. That's why you're pretending to work over here. You're right, I'm so pathetic. Obviously, you don't have to care of the people in the restaurant. Someone ordered, they made 22 minutes for a reason.
Karenicity runs deep in this one. Let's put up a picture, full mass of this particular Karen. You're too damn old to be arguing with a high schooler like that. It's a shame. Now, okay, you're upset. You're upset because somebody ordered a DoorDash. Now, damn it, that order could have been mine. I love DoorDash. Mm-hmm. But yes, Karen, that's how it works. That DoorDash order comes in at a certain time, just like your order. And likely that DoorDash order came in before yours. Starting to degrade another human being, especially a child, because you don't like the protocol of their service, is going too far. Log your complaint, send an email, call the 1 800 number, take your business elsewhere, don't shop there again. But to engage in that kind of rude behavior with a child, That's going to land you a spot on this show every time. All right, Sharon, thoughts here. Yeah, I mean, you got a spotlighter. This Karen's incredible. Her name is Marley. And even though Karen couldn't get it right, called her pathetic, called her the B word. Look, once you call someone a Tuesday, that's a wrap. But I've noticed that all these Karens have one thing in in common, Dr. Richie. They they tend to, to go off and then take their time. You notice how she just casually walked back to the table. Went to her guest who really was unfazed, the older gentleman was unfazed. And then she hurled more insults and waltzed on out of there. Karens take their time with this kind of personal affront. Yeah, I feel bad for the older gentleman at the end. Mm-hmm. I, I feel bad for him because you know, as soon as that started, he probably said to himself, oh hell, here we go again. <laughs> All right, we got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. Welcome back, we got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. I will read as many as I can. I can't read all of them for the sake of time. Thank you for chiming in. All right, cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug says, no, they don't get their money back. They need to pay for all that stuff they broke. That's right. Um, Gonzalez, how dare you not read my mind and make food exactly how I like it? Explosive selfishness. There's an update. All right, we have an update on a racist individual terrorizing neighbors. That racist person has finally been charged with a hate crime. Let's put up his picture. We've been following this story. In an update, federal agents have charged a white Wisconsin man with a series of hate crimes. He's alleged to have violated the civil rights of several black and brown people to get them to move out of his neighborhood. His name is William McDonald. That's the man that you see. On April 19th, the FBI executed a warrant to search McDonald's home in connection to the hate crimes. He did not have anything to do with the harassment, but agents report they found racist handwritten notes in his home. Williams previously reported the people he had been harassing to the police department over 26 years. Times one of the neighbors, McDonald Terrace. Let's put these neighbors up. All right, were Reginald Wilkerson and the fiance. Her name is Tanathai Addison, who said they have been targeted five times since the beginning of the year by McDonald. Okay, the couple, the couple, um, have not kept their baby daughter at the property for fear of her safety. All right. So he scares people, right? There's more. Let's put up some of the things he has done or alleged to have done. Uh, 
tires on the silver sedan were slashed multiple times. Most recently, the driver's side window was bashed in. But the most insidious part of the attack may have been the notes left behind. Multiple handwritten letters tucked into plastic bags threatened the couple using the N word and other profanity multiple times. Let's put up some of those letters, okay? One of the letters demanded the couple get the F out of my neighborhood N words. And another note read, you thought I was playing about driving and speeding in my neighborhood, you piece of ish. Get the F back to the F in North Side where you belong before I put my sand, before I put sand in your gas tank, okay? Let's put this picture up again. He's, let's put this picture up again. All right. So let's talk about this for a second. Um, hyper aggressive racism is where he is on the spectrum. Racism exists on the spectrum. He can't be helped. Uh, he would die a racist SOB. There is no help for him. He would not be redeemed. It's done, it's over with, okay? So for individuals like this, we need to make sure they are shamed, they are highlighted, and then they are excommunicated from normative society. In order for him to survive, he needs to survive in some dark, deep crevice of society. He deserves no benefit, he deserves no privilege. You give him any power, you give him any level of authority, you give him any amount of status, he will use it to abuse and harm others. He's rotten to the core. This is systemic racism. This is cultural and racial bias. Sharon, thoughts here. First of all, I hope in that crevice there's some crips and bloods. I think oh. that would be good for him too. I think that would be good for him. But a couple of observations, Rashad, the penmanship on this vile races, uh, it's good. It's remarkable mm. penmanship he has here. And it actually speaks to the investigation. Because here we have a guy who also called the police on black people in and around his apartment complex. He did it 26 times, it might have been in one day, mm-hmm. one or two days. And, and here's the difference, because earlier in the show, you talked about the Westfield, I think New Jersey Police Department doing everything the wrong way. Yep. Here we are in Wisconsin, I think it's called the West Ellis Police Department. What they did, what he called 26 times was, they didn't go there and act on it. They didn't tase any unarmed black men. They didn't kneel on anyone's neck, nope. All they did was show up and they got him on an illegal signal. And when he signed the citation, They turned that over to the FBI to assist in the investigation. And the FBI said, you know what? The A and the G here looks fantastic. It's him. And of course, G is important when you're doing that hard, hard N word situation. Mm -hmm. The G is very important. Mm -hmm. So here we have a situation that worked out the opposite way. I want to know about people like this motivation. And then I said, you know what? Why don't we just call the black girl that quit him? That's really what's going mm. on here. Find the black girlfriend, Dr. Richie, who quit it. Mm. Wow. And you know, it's it's fascinating also that the FBI and local police, they had to use some creative methods in order to get this guy, right? But routinely, this is an exception from that rule. Routinely we see police agencies use creative methods to make sure they protect one of their own. Uh, a white supremacist or even um, somebody who's terrorizing the community, but they may in fact be a conservative, right? Uh, So big ups to law enforcement. Uh, Once again, I'm not against police, I'm just against bad ones. Speaking of bad people in criminal justice systems, put up the picture of this judge. That judge is corrupt to the core. I'm going to explain it. Her name is Julia Halls Gordon. She has now been removed. Why? She destroyed evidence. She called the presiding judge over her son's case who was charged with assaulting. She's not been removed, but there's so much more to this, okay? 
The commission said Gordon, Judge Gordon, could have been disqualified based on the first count of the complaint alone by itself. That she sought to influence the amount of bond in a case against her son and destroyed evidence. Now I want you to remember, she destroyed evidence. Now she admitted to this, she destroyed evidence against her son. The panel said that constituted misconduct in the office and violated eight sections of the judicial canons of conduct. Well, good for these judges who said, well, damn it, destruction of evidence is a policy no no, and you can no longer be a judge. You know what else it is? It's a criminal offense. Is she going to jail? No. Is she being indicted? No. She destroyed evidence. You destroy evidence, you go to jail. If I destroy evidence, I go to jail. A judge destroys evidence, they get to retire. There's more. The agency also said she violated ethics rules by appointing a criminal defense lawyer. Now watch this, a criminal defense lawyer who represented her son as a guardian ad litem, allowing him to win fees. She presided over family court. So let me explain this before I continue. This judge presided over family court. Her son gets in trouble, right? Her son gets in trouble for assault. She then tells the guy in the courtroom, the attorney, I need you to defend my son and give some special breaks inside of her courtroom. And it said she tried to use her influence with the county jailer to win favorable treatment for her son. In a story in December, the Courier Journal reported Gordon told the agency in the letter that she was acting as a mother when she tried to help her son. Oh, okay. All right, destruction of evidence, okay. You're acting as a mother. Now let's break this down. You're acting as a mother to create a privilege for your son that nobody else in America would have. All right. Some people understand that. But you did something else here, Judge, didn't you? It was more than just destroying evidence, which is a crime. It was more than just using your influence with other judges, which is a crime. It was more than throwing your weight around at the local jail to get him special treatment, once again, a crime. It was more than that, wasn't it? Here's more. Other complaints against Judge Gordon. Judge Julia Halls Gordon also held court late into the night, sometimes requiring parents and their children to appear after midnight, unheard of, but she did it. And when a treatment center refused to test defendants for drugs, Gordon let her staff do so despite their lack of training. And they put urine samples in the same refrigerator where they stored their lunch, complete incompetence. The panel said Gordon's misconduct continued even after she learned she was the subject of a massive complaint and investigation. Judge Gordon, 42 years of age, who hails from an influential Owensboro family, it's a parking golf course named for the former mayor Ben Halls, her great uncle, was elected to a first term in 2016. Now what do we have here? We have generational privilege. You were privileged, your parents were privileged, your grandmama, granddaddy was privileged. Well, of course your son is going to be privileged, no matter how criminal he may be. See, here's what happens to the comfort of privilege. You never learn how to be a decent person. You never learn what it means to grow, to change because of challenges, to become better than the circumstances around you, to become fortified in values rather than money, to become fixated with doing good and not just getting power. That is the adverse effect of this kind of privilege. Now you're both are probably going to go to jail. Now, once again, we're going to keep the pressure high on this because she has been cited for ethical issues, violation of judicial conduct. But once again, they have proven she broke the law. Where's the district attorney? Where's the attorney general? Who's going to charge the judge? Sharon, thoughts here. Well, she may or may not go to jail. She'll get a court show first. That'll happen first, I guarantee you. She'll get herself a lucrative court show. This whole thing where she 
commingles the son, the drug abuse, his case. So it's in a way that only you know Clarence and Jenny Thomas can appreciate here. Where is the district attorney on this? And, and when do people like Judge Gordon get their comeuppance, Sean? When does that happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't that something? All right, we'll see. All right, I hate to do this to y'all. <laughs> what in the red state hell? You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face. It's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now, what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math. Somebody say amen. This is nanotechnology starting to organize. This is being injected from, from the bioweapon jabs, and it's starting to organize. They're starting to come together and form a lattice structure, which is going to form an AI, which is going to interface with Bluetooth, and it's going to be able to track anybody that took this shot. They're going to be able to track your heart rate, where you are, your location, your temperature. Right, this is all part of turning you into a, an AI transhuman. She actually practices medicine. Let's put up a picture full throttle. What state do you think she practices medicine in? Yeah, you guessed it, Florida. Let's keep a picture up. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Eads. She appears to have an active physician license. According to the Florida Board of Medicine, although her license was suspended in 2005 after the board found out she had not completed sufficient continuing medical education courses. She also previously claimed that the COVID vaccine will give you AIDS. She is a practicing physician in Florida. Now she's saying that the vaccine is actually making us, what is it? AI transhumans. I gotta say this, sounds pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> Sharon, <laughs> yeah. what are your thoughts about this? Well, sign me up, okay, <laughs> Dr. Eid, sign me up. It sounds wonderful to me too, and then I realized I'm, I got, the COVID vaccine and I'm boosted, about to get yeah. another one. I can't wait to sign up for my fourth shot. And I have an iPhone. So everything mm. she's talking about, wow. they done got me. Okay, they, they got, got me. They can track me everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so let me say this on a serious note. Obviously, this is the reason why we have so much dysfunction as it relates to basic science uh, and COVID 19. Individuals like this exist. And then not only do they exist, They have actual position and authority in medicine, in science. So naturally, this this one off, this person that is completely contrary to the um, normative field of science, uh, adverse to actual observation of science, will be the one person that the right promotes. Okay, they was all look at what Dr. Elizabeth Ede said at a conference that had 20 people in attendance on social media or something, right? And they'll cite her as being some kind of great scholar in medicine. And the truth is the woman is just off her rocker here, all right? This has no basis in any uh, testing that has been done, no credible testing at least, and no research that she has independently conducted. This is simply part of the conspiracy theory created based on a rumor mill and then enhanced due to the political culture of America. Sharon, we are so thankful to have you on Indisputable today. Tell people how they can follow you and check out your great work. Sharon Reed Live, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And let me say this, you mentioned earlier, Rashad, that you know I helped give you your start in TV. You were a star, a star from the beginning. Only difference now is you're wearing suits that are much more expensive. <laughs> okay, that's the only difference, okay, uh, you've earned you're it, too kind. you've earned it. Thank you, Sharon. I, you know, I appreciate our friendship. Brother. Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.